everyone, and welcome to Red Dog TV. This is Sting Red Dog here. Um, really excited about today. Let me get everybody on the screen here. There's me. And we'll bring in the special guest in just a second. So I wanted to welcome everybody here today. Um, we have a great, great, great interview with Brian Cronin, lead programmer for UWE. Joining me today as and helping me out is none other than Blind. How you doing, man? Oh, awesome. Hey, guys. Welcome, welcome. Um, another person that is here, um, kind of a silent partner, is Daigo from Nexus Esports. He's going to be helping us moderate the chat, uh, moderate questions and stuff like that. I've, you've seen him talking already in the chat, so um, welcome to him as well, and thanks for being here. Um, and if I can get his video feed pumped in here, um, we have Brian Cronin from UWE. Hey, how's it going? All right, so I'm glad everyone is here. We have about 50 people in the room right now with more coming in um, every second. So um, we started a couple minutes late. I wanted to give a little bit of minutes for the stragglers and stuff to get in here. So um, let us go ahead and start. So Brian, um, one, thanks for being here today. Yeah, of course, no problem. So I wanted to kind of just start off this interview with saying, you know, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your programming background. Okay, well, um, I'm originally from San Diego, California, and uh, I was in school down there, and I didn't like school, and a friend was working at a video game company and said, do you want to work for the video game company? And I said yes. So that is what got me started in programming. I was just doing it as a, a hobby and, I mean, with aspirations of working in video games, but... That was my in. So uh, I started working at that company, which was making cell phone games. This was before the iPhone and Android. This was um, like old flip phones and stuff like that. Wait, so like, a, so like, are we talking about like my Nokia had had that little um, that snake game that ate yeah. stuff and got longer? <laughs> is that right. No, so this is this is just after the era of snake. This is like we oh, had okay. colors. Okay. We could have multiple sprites moving around and sound, and it was pretty advanced stuff. Snazzy. You know, we had like 16k <laughs> of memory we had available to us. Um, yeah, yeah I worked on like a, the one game that we actually released at that company was a game for the Da Vinci Code movie. So it was like a adventure, isometric adventure game. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then. But, uh, and then. Yeah. So from there, I uh, I had I had another kind of weird job in programming that wasn't really games, and then I eventually moved up to the Bay Area. Um, to work on my own games, and I, I released a game called Zero Gear on Steam, um, which is a go-kart multiplayer, like, physics-type game. Um, and from there, I, I met up with Unknown Worlds guys at their local post-mortem event and started working with them. Awesome. So what? So now that you started working with them, what, what do you specifically do as the lead programmer for UWE? Like, your holistic responsibilities, what day-to-day -day work or what does a typical day look like for you? I guess uh, overall my job is to well I, I one of my big tasks is to release builds like I view myself as really responsible for getting the game released um, we release anywhere from every two weeks to a month about so that's kind of my my overall goal I guess and so I, I coordinate primarily the programmers but I work with a lot of other team members as well to make that happen and to kind of prioritize tasks based on on releasing um, and so I, I serve as sort of a, a leadership role in general when it comes to programming and day to day it's it, it changes almost every day but um, generally uh, I, I mean some of the higher level tasks I work on I guess are things related to um, like server operation, I spend a lot of time on tools to make server operation better, um, tools surrounding the game um, to actually make the game playable. Um, like I'm going to be working on a voting interface pretty soon, um, that type of thing. I work on a lot of gameplay as well, and since release, work on a lot of bugs, um, as long as everyone else, everyone's doing bugs. Um, optimization, just all sorts of things. Working on, on the, the game editing tools here and there, um, yeah. Okay. So that kind of answers okay. it. So, so most recently, in the last couple days, what have you been focusing on? 
Um, I guess this week I've put a big focus on modding and documentation. Has kind of been my primary focus. So I, I made a modding tutorial and I put it up on the Unknown World site, and I hope people. I hope that kind of gets people an idea of how to like just get started with modding. So that was the idea with that tutorial, how to just, here are the steps of just getting a mod onto the workshop that does something. And so I'm going to try and do more of those tutorials that focus more on specific aspects of modding. Um, I did some documentation as well for our, for our engine. So when you're writing code for gameplay, um, how you interface with the engine. So I did that a lot. I worked on AI a bit. There was uh, some work on AI this week that we're just kind of experimenting with initially. And I helped out with that a little bit on yesterday with uh, making so the Marines can buy shotguns at the armory. And talking a lot with Steve, who was kind of leading that, that endeavor about, about bots. So that was, that was fun. Um, I was working a little bit on adding sounds to our Mod Jam game, the, the heist Mod Jam game. We didn't really have a lot of sounds in there. So I was working on that and sort of improving the the workflow of using sounds in, in a mod. And then finally, I've, I was working a lot on a, a personal project. I, I have these uh, game projects I'm working on every week, and so I was working on that a lot this week as well, outside of uh, my normal Unknown Worlds work. You know, it's funny. That just blew my mind that I asked, what were you working on in the last couple of days? And if that's the amount of stuff you've been working on in the last two okay, days, well, that, you that are like Superman. The whole week I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so before we move into the, the next section about just programming and, and modding questions, um, one, I wanted to thank so far the, the audience uh, and the NS2 community. Um, a lot of these questions have been sourced by you guys, um, and I just wanted to thank you first and foremost uh, for submitting so many questions, and, and you bogged me down on, on having to sort through um, a billion questions just to come up with some of the best ones, so thank you for that. Um, however, I wanted to also ask um, if, you, if during this interview, you guys, you have a question that we haven't gone over or, or whatever, go ahead and ask it in the Twitch chat. Um, Daigo from Nexus Esports is moderating the chat for questions. Um, he'll be picking um, some that are pertinent for, for Brian, um, and he'll be putting it in a document for us. So at the end of this interview, we can go ahead and try to take care of those questions live um, with Brian. So if you do have a question anytime during this interview, go ahead and post it, um, and we'll try to get to it. I'm not promising that we'll get to all of them. Um, or that we'll even select all of them, you trolls out there. <laughs> but we'll try to get to most of them. So, um, great. Moving into the programming and modding question. So, Brian, in general, um, you know, what's it like working with a brand new engine such as Spark? Like, what are the benefits and drawbacks to something like that? Um, before going into that, I just want to, if, if you see me, like, I have a cat on my lap here, so I'm petting it. So if I'm doing weird... If I'm doing weird arm motions, it's because I'm petting the cat. So just so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. And and since that's off the screen, um, yeah, make sure um, yeah, you guys just, do there know be that. Some confusion, and I don't want there to be that confusion. <laughs> I can see, I can see this being edited <laughs> really bad. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> All right. So so yeah. Well, I mean, what's it like working with the brand new Spark engine and benefits and drawbacks of that? Um, well, I. I guess the, the benefits of working with your own engine are that you just have all the code there. You could go in and, and you know exactly how it works and you could tweak it to work exactly how you want it to work. So it's, uh, it's been very flexible during the development of Natural Selection 2. Um, if we needed to change something, it was generally pretty easy to change it. I mean, generally pretty easy to change it, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes a, a change involved a couple months of work, but um, relatively easier. And uh, I guess the drawbacks, well, we were developing the engine while developing the game, which is, it has its benefits and, and you know, negatives, and that was challenging. I think, uh, you know, a, a, another game we make based off of Spark would go a lot smoother. Just all the experience we have, but also just not having to, to write so much of that engine code off the start. Okay, and... Like, how goes the progress of making Spark compatible with OpenGL? Well, that's uh, that's a task that is being worked on um, for for NS2 and just for future pro projects. And 
Um, I don't know, it's still very much in development, so I, I can't say a whole lot, both because I, I don't know a whole lot about it, that's something Max is mostly working on, and uh, just because, you know, it's kind of an unknown thing, but it's 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 going to happen, it's, uh, it's very promising. Alright, so what are the limitations of the Spark engine when you talk about it in terms of, let's say, modding, and how far could it be taken? Yeah, there's, I'm not going to admit to any limitations. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take that offline. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's it's a very very moddable engine for sure. The all the gameplay code is written in in Lua, which is a, a programming it's a scripting language, a programming language that um, doesn't need to be compiled, and that means it's it's very easy to write code for it and have it work in game. You just open Notepad or um, some text editor you like and write the code and save it, and then the game will load it. So um, and that controls everything. The, the game engine doesn't really have a concept of a, what a player is or a, a gun or anything like this. So it's, it's the game code that describes these game entities and how they interact. So it is a, it's a very moddable engine for sure. It's, it's, uh, right now the biggest problem is that it's so moddable that it's, it's kind of, uh, there's not a lot of structure in terms of someone coming in new of how, to, how do I actually make something happen. And that's what we're trying to address with, with tutorials and videos and uh, that that kind of um, you know progress is being made. That makes sense. As an addition, I mean, if you talk about all this in the, the the modding code, like, do you have templates on how you add stuff, or do you have all kind of like the entities you're talking about that have to go every time from scratch when you do a new mod? Um, well, okay, like if you're making a mod for NS2, like you're adding a new weapon or something like that, there's a lot of there's a lot of frameworks to build off of. So there's a concept of a weapon that you would kind of base your mod off of, and there's a lot of references there. If you're making a brand new game, like a, like the, the heist mod jam game we made, didn't involve NS2 code. Um, very little NS2 code. We pulled a little bit in here and there, but it was, it was kind of its own code base. And so from there, you just have the concept of of a game entity, which is just an object in the world with a position, you know, and then from there you give it the ability to have a model so you can see it and make it so it can animate and make it play sounds and all these things are, are concepts in the engine, but to, to make something into a game object, you have to kind of tie them all together um, into some sort of game entity that you're writing code for. That's cool. I mean, so, can, you know, you talked about building um, you, you built Spark and, and the game at the same time. So, can you tell us, uh, you know, about the way you know game programming, like gameplay programming and engine programming, influence each other while working on NS2? Sure. Um, yeah, they're they're very, you know, they're very tightly coupled. And I guess the goal of make the engine is to to make it so the gameplay code doesn't need to know so much about the the nitty gritty details. And uh, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Nothing's really coming to mind, but um, yeah, the I guess I, I'll try and give an example of how how it works, how the how the gameplay code um, uses the engine. So the engine is kind of a a server for the gameplay code. It is a uh, it's running the certain parts, certain functions in the gameplay code every frame or on certain events. You know, like. When an entity is destroyed, maybe it'll call into the gameplay code, and the gameplay code might do something based off that, like play a sound. Um, and so the gameplay code is, is you know, when a map loads, the engine will tell it all the entities are in the map, and the gameplay code will load those entities in whatever way it sees fit. Um, and so that's kind of the, the connection between those two. Um, and so they, they're very tightly coupled. Like if there's a change in the networking model, for example, this happened a lot during the development of NS2. So um, you know, we, maybe we used to have this function that was called when a new update came in from the network so that the gameplay code could, could synchronize all that data and respond to it in some way. And that was removed at some point because it was, it was very slow and we needed to make the game faster. So that concept was removed. And as a result, we had to adjust a lot of gameplay code um, to take that into consideration. All right. And talking about a specific task of an engine, or the gameplay program, I have basically a triple question here. This um, concerns a recording system currently. I mean, how does it work? Is it more in a game code? Is it an engine code? And um, also, 
why the file's so big when we record stuff? And is there a way or how much work would it involve or what would be necessary in terms of changing maybe the engine or the gameplay to do something like a HLTV similar server-side recording? Um, well, I mean, you could get fraps that'll record the game. So I think that's a pretty good way to go. But um, to seriously answer the question, the uh, the current there's like a few ways you could go about recording kind of gameplay or the game and streaming it back out in some way. Obviously, you could capture the frame, which is the most robust way. But obviously, um, you can't change the camera angle and stuff like that. Um, so another method is to kind of capture all the input going into the game, so all the buttons I'm pressing, the mouse movements and have the game run again deterministically. So the game is doing the same thing every frame based off the same input, and that uh, will result in the same frame being generated. But you could still move the camera around in that, in that scenario and um, get different points of view. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of what's going on right now in the NST recording system. And the other way is to sort of record the outputs. So you would capture what the state of the model at the time, like what animations it's in, what texture it has, uh, the values of its um, shader parameters, stuff like this, and when sounds are played in the world, etc. So you capture all that output of the game, and uh, you could play that back. Um, so that's that's the, I don't know how something like HLTV works, but that's the most robust method. Um, just because if there's if there's any change to the game code right now in NS2 it tends to break recordings because, like I said, it, it really depends on the state of the game being the same, um, mm -hmm. or like running back in a deterministic method manner. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we would need to do to, to really make it, like right now it's really a debugging tool. It's something that we are using during development and it's not really intended for kind of um, a recording and playback of gameplay um, type of system. So we would have to really make it a lot more robust to, to use in that manner. I think I remember um, back with HLTV, um, with the server-side recording, how, how a match can be recorded uh, and then reap and then kind of launched. And you could, you could basically, you know, spec any, any player and, you know, it recorded the entire, entire instance of, of the game. Um, would there be any plans of, of that, you know, happening in, in NS2, or is that even possible? I mean, it's, it's certainly possible, but it would probably be a lot of work. There's no plans for that type of thing currently. I think we, we see all the um, stream that's going on on services like Twitch and YouTube, and uh, that's just a lot easier for us. And it, it's, a lot, it's very popular, too. Um, so we kind of view that as sort of that feature for the game right now. Um, I wouldn't rule it out as a as a possibility in the future, but um, we don't really have immediate plans for it. Okay. So, uh, are are there any plans to create proper documentation? You, you kind of touched on this actually earlier. Are there any plans to create proper documentation uh, and add additional comments to the Lua, like in forms of, like, say, a Lua wiki, uh, to foster the modding community? Yeah, definitely. There's. Um... There are tutorials being made. I'm going to continue making some more of those. They do take a lot of time, so I have to um, won't be happening too often. But those, I think, are a really great way to show how you just basically make a mod for NS2. And then in addition, we do have the wiki, which I'm trying to uh, use more. I'm trying to get other people to use it more, too. So I, I've started adding a little bits of knowledge to the wiki, the official Unknown Worlds wiki. And I hope other people will do that as well. Um, so that's the, the second, you know, tier. And then the third tier is that we have just recently in this last patch created uh, automated documentation for the engine. So for where the, the Lua gameplay code calls into the engine, we now have that documented in some way. And so it tells you all the, the parameters into those functions and the return values and that basic stuff. And then I, I've started working on getting some actual documentation there to tell you what the function is doing, um, at least in a very basic way to start. And then I kind of want to see what, what people are confused with, what they want more documentation on, and then we could uh, document that even better. So that's that's kind of the three first steps of um, of that. The the engine we plan to document pretty well in terms of um, the connection to the gameplay code. So that's what we're focusing on the most. The NS2 code, it changes very fast, and so. 
to document it properly would probably take way too much effort, and that effort would happen, have to happen almost every patch. So I kind of want to just make the uh, NS2 gameplay code easier to understand. Um, I, that's, I, my, throughout this whole project, that's been a lot of my work, has just been um, simplifying the NS2 code base. Because it just grows and grows and grows, and eventually you gotta gotta clean things up. So I spent a lot of time trying to make the code base easier to understand, easier to use. And um, outside of that, I think it's just education through things like uh, tutorials on the website. That's really cool, helping out all the mothers and get more support. Um, but talking about Lure, another question popped up, and that goes a little bit more past in the time when you made the decisions or when the decisions were made about the game engine, why was exactly Lure chosen for the game level scripting and was there other languages like Python or others um, considered for that? Yeah, well, I mean, the the programming committee of all programming languages got together in 2009, I think, and decided that Lua was the best scripting language. So it was just objectively determined that it was the best scripting language and so we chose that um, was kind of the reasoning. Awesome. So, so that's that's a lie. There's there's no programming committee that decides on programming language. <laughs> I, I joke because like you know whenever what? you ask Brian programmers just... why 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 this language versus that, there's always these arguments that could go on for days. And so I like to like to view these things as objective decisions that can be made. But to you know, Lua versus other languages to try and answer the question. Um, <laughs> Lua has a history in the game industry, so it's used a lot in the game industry, and that's for various reasons. I think the primary ones are it has a has a history of being very fast, which is always important with games, and it is it is very fast, and it's uh, it's a very simple language, which which you know programmers always strive for simplicity. So it's a language that has very few rules, and if you understand those rules, you could make the language do anything, and that's that's why I like it a lot. And versus something like Python. Um, you know, it's it's just a personal preference. I mean, Python is is a bit slower than Lua, just at least in the default implementations, and things like LuaJIT, you know, you can make Lua a lot faster even. So there there's a lot of debate of why you use this versus that, but it just kind of it, it comes down to a lot of complex decisions. A lot of them are just personal decisions. But I I've been using Lua for years, and I I love Lua, so I'm I'm really happy with that decision. Yeah, and you know what, Brian, you could have told me that every scripter in the world came together every three months to discuss, and I would have totally been like, oh, wow, that happens? Awesome, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> blind, blind, blind is, you know, knows coding and stuff. I'm the layman, so I would have totally believed you. <laughs> I will definitely make use of that into the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know, with with things like view range, uh, lure performance, uh, and map floors be fine tuned in the next version of Spark. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not actually sure what the the map floors. I saw that question. I'm not really sure what the map floors is referring to, but um, or the the view range. Yeah, view range. So like that that is something that is moddable uh, to certain extents, and um, yeah, there's reasons why the the range is limited currently mainly due to like networking bandwidth but uh, all that stuff is intended to be very moddable and if it's not currently we will make it moddable and uh, we have plans for Lua performance improvements um, that are in the works but will probably take a while to to actually finish I'm talking about performance you already gave a head that with Lua JIT you could maybe um, get some increasement there we have also the question um, how, so there obviously was an experiment, as I heard, and how did the experiment LuaJIT turn out, and is it worth to implement? So we were using LuaJIT originally on NS2. Um, when I was first started working on it almost three years ago, we were using LuaJIT, and we uh, decided to switch away from it, and that was because we had some kind of custom aspects we wanted to use in Lua that it would have been very difficult to make LuaJIT work with. Um, and at the time, it wasn't really giving us a huge performance gain, and that was probably for a lot of reasons. But recently, we've started looking into it more. And the thing about LuaJIT is you can't really just plug it into your game and expect it to work just like Lua. It, uh, it needs some custom work to be done to really take advantage of it. And once you do take advantage of LuaJIT, it can be very fast. And so we did some initial experiments. Uh, Steve, uh, Program at Worlds, primarily worked on that. And it was very promising, like uh, very, very promising with with some 
you know, there was a lot of crashes and stuff like that. So that's the nature of experimental work. But uh, it and it, the experimentation continues, and um, so it is still being worked on in 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 the uh, as sort of a side project. It's 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 gonna it's basically gonna it's a lot of work and um, a lot of thought has to be put into it. And so it is being worked on, but it's kind of a little bit for right now. Awesome. So how how is the pro the next question is how is the progress in smoothing out delays in the net code yeah um we i mean generally we feel the net code is pretty good we don't hear a lot of complaints about the net code specifically um and in our experience the net code hasn't been a major problem um throughout the development we worked on that a lot so um, yeah, we're happy that that's the case, but yeah, we still plan to smooth out any delays people are experiencing. Um, if people are experiencing unusual delays that cannot be accounted for through, you know, packet loss or the such, then uh, we would like to know about it basically and get some more information. You heard it there, um, folks. So make sure you submit that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fill in the reports. Um, talk, since we're already talking the whole time about performance, um, on summarized, how much performance um, increase could we realistically expect and what kind of time frame um, would we look at it to be delivered? Um, there is probably some more performance that could be gained through graphics. Um, and that is something that this work on our rendering tech that has been going on recently could help out with, at least for the majority of, of people. People that are stuck in DirectX 9 um, using graphics cards basically from like eight years ago, it's gonna be hard to help them out more with with graphics. So we our best bet there is probably to add some more options to, to lower you know settings even more. And then in terms of CPU usage, I think the work with Luigit, if that pans out, will probably be the biggest improvement. Um, that's kind of what I, I see, at least. Awesome. Well, thanks. That actually concludes our programming slash modding questions. So um, moving into the next section of questions, which kind of pertain to natural selection, too. Um, the first one here is, you know, if you could have done something different from the beginning of NS2 development, what would that be and why? Oh, that's the question. <laughs> that's, um, it. that's it. Oh, there's another one that's later that one. Blind has that is a doozy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we'll wait till we but get we'll to that one. <laughs> so, uh, I, well, first of all, I wasn't, I wasn't with the company right when NS2 development started. And uh, my cat is... Yeah, I don't know if they could hear that, but that's my cat just totally freaking out. I don't know why. So I wasn't there right at the start of NS2 development. But if I was, I would have said, I mean, knowing what I know now, I think we should have just totally focused on Marine versus Skulk gameplay without any else going on, without the commander, without um, any of the other aliens or upgrades or just a rifle and a Skulk um, when wall walking. Like, that's, that's what I think should have been worked on you know, in hindsight, for like the first six months of development. And there's always the pressure to push more stuff into there. And there was always a, you know, the, the time frame of the project was kind of unknown as well for a long time, when I was working there, at least. And so, you know, if you feel like the game's going to be done in a year, spending so much time on, on just a subset of the game seems wasteful. But in hindsight, knowing what we all know now, I think that would have been the most valuable thing to do for, for literally about six months. Oh, sounds sounds cool. And um, talking about some concept or from the change, is was there actually any part of an original concept in a game that has proved completely impossible to implement? Um not really. I mean the the one thing that comes to mind is dynamic infestation originally was supposed to be different. Um it was supposed to be more dynamic, where you're actually like placing down these individual, almost pieces of the infestation and, and growing it out more organically. And I want to say that would be impossible to do. It would just it would take a lot of time to make it fun to play. I mean, it's the type of thing that sounds cool, but I don't know if it would really be fun. So make it 
hard to be fun to play, make it fit into the gameplay well, and, it, you know, technically it would be difficult to implement properly, at least to make it performant. So that was something that um, would probably at least be, you know, difficult to do. I don't know if, I don't think it would be impossible. That's the only thing that's really coming to mind right now. But I think it's probably better off that the infestation works, worked out the way it did. I think it's probably better how it is now than kind of what the original vision for it would have would have been. That makes sense because you have targets you know you can hit and kill. So it's actually, yeah, I like it too. And about features, um, what feature would have loved to implement but could not or could not yet due to technical restrictions? Yeah, the, the one thing that came to mind with that one is... Oh, God, there's a cat here. Hold on. He wants to be part of the interview. <laughs> yeah, it's just there's drinks around and there's laptops and yeah, it's not good. She wants more love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let me... Right, so uh, which one was it? <laughs> would have been um, difficult to implement? Yeah, what, what feature would you love to implement but could not or could not yet due to technical restrictions? Right. Yeah, um, one thing I think would be really cool is if the phase gates acted more like portals, where you see through them, like the, the you know, Portal and Portal 2 gameplay. Oh, and if cool. you could that just cool. stream right through them, so if there's no delay in, in teleporting, and you could just kind of walk right through and see what's going on on the other side, I think that would be really neat. And you'd very, it'd be much more intuitive in terms of where you're going in the map, what's on the other side of the phase gate. Could you um, imagine, so imagine. If, if that was happening and you just see a skulk on the other side biting it and you just basically shoot bullets right through like portal? <laughs> yeah, presumably that would work, right? <laughs> we would hear everybody scream on that one. <laughs> sure. I mean, a lot of these things, like, I don't know, when I think of gameplay, I, I don't think of balance immediately. It's kind of like, what would be the most fun thing? What would you just expect to work that way? And balance is this thing you can kind of, it's pretty malleable, you can kind of tweak it to make it work. So, I, I don't know, with that kind of stuff, I think having portals you could shoot through and see through with the phase gates would be far cooler than not having it. So, uh, keeping going on with, with some features, so in the beginning when you joined and, and all this stuff, so what feature would you have loved to have implemented, but you couldn't because everybody else thought your idea just sucked? <laughs> Yeah, that would be diplomatic victory. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Like, there's gonna be a, a, a table, and then, you know, a skulk comes no, in, exactly. sits down, and then a marine comes in and sits down. <laughs> well, okay, so there, there'd be a room in each of the maps. I've thought about this, I really have. There, and there are also gambling points, but so there'd be a room in each of the maps, and you could, um, the way it works is as long as three representatives from each team are in that room, a countdown starts, right? And as long as no one kills another player for, let's say, two minutes, both teams win. <laughs> you know, like, as soon as, soon as someone kills NFL? another player, <laughs> diplomatic relations shut down, it's wartime. <laughs> Well, I don't know why I'm thinking on the pilot episode of Battlestar Galactica. I don't know why I'm thinking that. And that's how everything starts. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Alright. So, let's go just move over. And the next question is just quote as it is, because I think you already covered, covered it a little bit earlier, but um, just for the sake of completion. Ooh, what's, your long, yeah, what's your long-term prediction of fixing the biggest issues in NS2? Hit registration, performance, and the handling of packet loss. Well, as a representative on the worlds, I have to first not acknowledge any of those as, as actual problems, obviously. <laughs> Correct. It's, but, it's um, a quote of that question. Quoted, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of the diplomatic way to respond to this. He would probably be, would know, you know, he's probably would be coaching me here. Um, <laughs> so I mean, we're, we're going to fix them, I guess. If there's problems, we're going to fix Yeah, it's, uh, there's always a lot of problems in a game and especially a game as complicated as NS2 there's just always problems right and some of these problems are subjective problems like some people think it's great and some people think it's a problem and so um, you know things like hit registration throughout the development of NS2 we have fixed every time we've been able to determine there's hit registration we fixed problems and so as of right now 
we believe the heritage tradition is is pretty good. Um, I've not heard. Of, I mean, throughout development, we heard a lot that heritage registration is off, etc. And that was, that was true. That was just there's so many minor details that could affect hit registration and it's something that is largely subjective i mean it's hard to measure it properly and uh, even t sometimes you'll measure it and it is good but like in other weird cases it's not so it's always a mix of there could be something subjective that people are interpreting that isn't actually hit reg but is affecting their um, subjective experience of, of hit reg and so that's something that we could still address or improve and uh, if there are bugs that sneak into the game that are affecting hit reg, we will fix them. Um, and again, people people in the past have sent in YouTube videos demonstrating problems like hit reg, and those are always very useful to us. Um, performance is it's always something that's being worked on in in one way or another, and oftentimes it's the type of thing where it's a it's a project that's in development for like three months. Like somebody's working on something over a period of three months that eventually is going to help out performance. Is going to give people like one percent boost. That's just how it is at, at this point. And you know, as mentioned uh, uh, previously, we have some bigger things in, in the pipeline that could help there. So last question in this section. Um, are there any big changes on the horizon for NS2 that we can look forward to that maybe you can even say? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, see, I always forget what is sort of known and what I'm supposed to not say. So I have to be careful. Well, just but say it all. What I could we'll, we'll let you know. We'll yeah, here, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing that's super secretive, but there's things that we like to just sort of hold back because, you know, we're, we're trying to... If you just say everything, like, over a period of time, then there's no impact, and it's hard to, to get any, um, you know, promotion for something like that. So that's that's really the only reason why we, we hold anything back. So, I mean, something that I think is important, that is being worked on a lot, Andy is working on it, is the balance changes. So he has a lot of um, subtle, some subtle and some not so subtle balance changes in the pipeline, and people should should play the balance mod. There's uh, usually a server up running playing it, and give feedback, because that feedback is really important. Um, and that's the probably the biggest change um, in the short term that is that people are really going to notice. Um, is balance changes. Another thing I'll say is I, I, I personally hope that modding will really start taking off soon. We're, we're really pushing modding right now. We want people to make all sorts of cool game modes for NS2 and brand new games using the engine. So I'm hoping that will, I mean, it, it, there are already are a lot of really cool mods out there. Um, Combat probably being the most popular and a, a lot of other um, mods. And so we're hoping that'll take off too. And there are game, new game features and stuff like that in the works. And that's the kind of stuff I'm probably, you know, I don't know what's been said already, so I'm just not going to talk about that. <laughs> All right. So um, that concludes um, our section on uh, natural selection stuff. So um, as we move on to the next section here, um, I know, guys, that you have been submitting questions in the chat. I wanted to thank you um, for that. We do have, let me see here. Yeah, we actually do have um, a handful of questions already um, that have been submitted, so we'll definitely get to those um, in a bit. Um, we do, actually, before we start those, let's actually get to some audience questions now, shall we? You ready for that, Brian? Can you answer some questions yeah, sure. live here? Questions Shoot. Live here? All right, so we are going to go, and this is going to kind of span over the natural selection, over programming, modding, all that stuff that we've talked about so far. So one of the questions here that Durden2 um, asks, how much progress are you guys making in speeding up the Lua layers? Okay, I'm trying to interpret Lua layers right now. Um, I guess, I mean, that, that's kind of the, I, I can answer that just by saying, stuff is being worked on. It's hard to answer something like that specifically. <laughs> I, 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 if there was more detail on what what they mean by Lua layers, I guess it would be useful to know. Okay, we can ask um, Durden2 to kind of expand on that question. We can come back to it. So, um, Chisler2, is there any intention to add a theater mode like COD and Halo for Mashamania and playbacks? Yeah, I mean, if, if like I said, if we had the, a better playback mechanism, I think it would be really fun to work on a theater mode. It's the kind of thing where the camera just automatically 
you can kind of sit back and it shows you the action. I think that's what they mean by theater mode. I would guess so, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess so, yeah. I don't know. I, I've not used one of these modes myself, but it, that seems like it'd be fun to just work on, like, as a project. So if we had the playback system, I mean, that I'm sure that would happen just because it, it sounds cool. And that's generally, like, when we work on new features, it's it's oftentimes what we decide to make is what sounds the most fun to work on in, in a lot of cases. Um, so that would that's the type of stuff that gets done faster. Right. The next question oh, ahead, submitted sorry. here by Danjo is Many games have a Twitch chat support, so will NS2 get this too? That's, um, so yeah, the Twitch has an API that you could use in your game to broadcast out to Twitch and to bring the chat from Twitch into, into the game or however you want to implement it. And we have um, been looking into the, the Twitch API, and I think that's promising. It, it doesn't look like it would be that hard to do. And uh, so, yeah, that's something that could happen, I guess is what I'll say. But we don't, it's, it's nothing in the short term that we're, we're working on. There's, a little, there's some higher priority stuff to work on. But, um, yeah, that's, that's something I guess we'd like to hear feedback on if people think that would be, would be really cool to have in NS2, I guess. And Zephram asks, is good looking easily readable code better than functional code? I would say largely, yeah. Well, I mean, if it's not functional, then that's bad. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't know what it's logically doing, yes. It's just... <laughs> so I, I guess I would have to go with functional in that in the pure sense. But yeah, I personally value very simple code um, and something that is very easy to just read, like where someone like my mom who doesn't understand programming could kind of read the code, like a, a few lines of code, and have a general idea of what's going on. And uh, that's something that I think a language like Lua supports pretty well, because the syntax of Lua is pretty lightweight. It's uh, There's not a whole lot of like curly brackets and semicolons and uh, things in there to kind of obfuscate the code, which are important for other languages, but Lua is able to do without. So I very much value um, code that is very easy to read. Um, I don't even like to use that many comments in code, just because I feel like the code itself should self-comment. And so I will use comments when appropriate, but it's not something I feel compelled to do, like after every line of code, put a comment. Um, that's when you got to just start asking yourself if the code is just too complicated. Fully approved. I would love to answer that question myself too, since also as a programmer, easy readable code, I, I would always prefer that, because if it's not functional, it's also easy for others to pick up. And it's f funny the question in there, but yeah, I, I would be surprised if we would have answered otherwise. <laughs> so, well, I guess a good example is if, like, you might have a trade-off be, between performance and readability or simplicity, and it's a, it's a difficult trade-off to make, but it, when measuring, like if the performance gains aren't that big, or if it's in an area of code that you're not really suffering that much from, like if you know all your performance time is spent in animation and you're optimizing pathfinding and you're making the pathfinding code way more difficult to work with, that's you know even if you get a one percent boost in performance of pathfinding, that's kind of a loss because you're just making it really difficult to work with the pathfinding code. So that's that's where you just there's always these trade-offs. You can't say that performance is most important or code readability is most important or you know functional code whatever it's all uh it's all well functional code i, I think is the most important <laughs> that's, yeah. That's kind of the, yeah but you, you know what i mean in the long term of course yeah but i completely agree with that um running over to the next question by bot hybrid any integration of head mounted displays plan <laughs> oh so this is like the oculus rift right i don't know i, I think so <laughs> I, I saw oculus rift being talked about in the chat when it would glance oh, over okay how funny how would that be if you that be? <laughs> yeah the same as oculus rift um, i heard you say head mountain displays and that sounds a lot more interesting <laughs> to me. i'm trying to figure out what that would be head mountain um yeah so i guess we we definitely don't have plans right now to integrate um something like oculus rift i don't know if it would work i mean maybe for the marine but i feel like the aliens move so quick that that would just get you thrown up really quick or at least having a nasty headache yeah. but we are getting a an oculus rift in the office pretty soon they we pre-ordered one with the kickstarter 
So it's supposed to be here very soon. I'm not sure why it's not there yet. And uh, so we might do something with it, but I don't know if it'll be NS2 related. I don't know what it will be or if, you know, we'll see. I, I don't know what would be more entertaining, actually playing it or watching somebody play it while a skulk is circling around him trying to bite his feet. <laughs> Just be going like this. Yeah. <laughs> that would be hilarious. All right, so um, we'll, we'll take a break from the audience questions for right now, guys. Thanks for submitting those. Uh, we'll, we'll go right back up and finish out our um, kind of miscellaneous questions that we have uh, up top here, and then we'll finish out with uh, with those questions. Sorry about the stream going down. Um, I had to switch to the Chicago Twitch server, um, the LA one. LA bugged one. Out yeah, on you blamed it on LA. Yeah. I am going to blame it on LA. <laughs> All right, so uh, going into the next section here. So how goes the progress of small, mainly cosmetic things like female marines, for instance? Uh, the female marines, uh, I haven't seen the progress. I mean, I've seen, I see it occasionally in the company chat room, and it's it's definitely coming along. It's I think it's done being modeled, and cat, and uh, I think the animations are being worked on now. So progress is uh, definitely moving forward on the female marine. Um, I'm not sure what other cosmetic changes are being referred to, but that's the, the female marine model at least. Um, are you going to be able to like when the What's the plans on actually implementing the female marine? Are is someone going to be able to, to choose like the you know male or female or, or when they spawn it's random? Um, yeah, my understanding and it, it may very well have changed since I last heard this, but the way it's supposed to work is uh, we're in the menu. You could currently choose what armor you have, so there'll just be an option to to choose between male and female. And I, I believe, don't take my word for it because I'm not entirely sure, but I believe there's going to be a version of the female marine for the three different armor types we have for the male. So it'll just be that you could choose male or female, and then if you have the, the black armor or the deluxe armor, you could choose on either the male or female. So that's how I think it's supposed to work. Okay, and, and you know, yeah. down, down the road, male or female skulks, male or female fades, is... <laughs> is the... Well, that's the thing, like... Who's to say? It could be that the the lurk is female, right? <laughs> it, it could it's be. It's a Twitter. It's <laughs> both true. <laughs> all right, so yeah, I'm going on the next question for all. Actually, this is an interesting one for pe new people. For all aspiring programmers out there, is there any advice you personally can give to people who want to get into the business? Uh, yeah. I mean, the first thing is to ask, like. Do you really want to be in this business? I think that's a good question. Um, like game programming specifically, at least, or even game development, is uh, I mean, a lot of companies. I, I feel like Unknown Worlds is is better than most, but a lot of companies really push people, and it's a it's a well known thing. Like when I, I went to a, a conference recently for Lua, um, and the, it was primarily programmers not in the game industry. It was just a Lua programming conference, and I would tell people I work in the game industry, and they would go, "Oh, really?" Sorry about that. Like there, there's a sort of meme out there that working in the game industry is, is, you know, low pay and long hours and, you know, exploitative and all this. And, and again, Unknown Worlds is, is not like this at all, which is, is really great. And I think it's definitely... They're probably talking you know, about EA employees. I, I don't know specifically what they're talking about, but it's just, it's a, it's a meme that's out there, right? So yeah. that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, like, it, I, I guess I'll just talk about programming, because that's what I know best. But uh, see if school is for you. Like school is something that um, will help a lot of people. Um, either a traditional college or there's a lot of game schools out now. So that's something to look into. But it's not the only only path. Like I I didn't really go through school to to get into the game industry. I, it was a combination of I I knew a friend who you know was working at a company who was looking for programmers and. I would just work on games a lot of my on my free time. So I would, uh, while I was working a job at like something like Best Buy, you know, I'd go home and be working on on projects, whatever they were. And a lot of them didn't amount to anything. But I would say, you know, starting off as programming games, um, no matter what type of programmer you are, no matter what experience level, just try and um, complete stuff. Like try and make something in an evening or over a period of a week, and and plan to finish it and to release it, even if releasing it means 
posting a link out on Twitter that like no one might not even click on. It doesn't matter, but just releasing something and going through the process of making a game, something like a Tetris clone or a Breakout clone or a Shoot 'em Up or whatever, is really great experience. And um, I, and specifically, I would recommend a tool like Love 2D is a tool I use a lot, which is a, a Lua framework for making games. And really simple, really easy to use, um, quick to start up, and as well as something like Unity, which is very popular, a 3D game making tool. Those types of tools um, are f quick and easy to start up with. You know, making a complex game will take just as long as any other framework, obviously. But uh, that's what I would recommend for people who want to get into the game business is just to start making games. It's so easy now. Just, just kind of do it. That's what I always say. All right. <clears throat> and uh, so, I mean, the next question here, um, I mean, it seems pretty easy. Um, how many skulk, skulk, skulls when a lurk lurks on a chlorf? It's uh, 23 to 26 in that range. Oh, okay, great. Blind? Sounds good. Will you continue to work on La Forge or the Haste, the Heist in your spare time? Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that was a really fun game to work on, and I don't know how much I'll work on it in my free time anymore. But I still plan to like we have some sound effects I'm still working on getting in. Um, that's one thing, thing specifically I want to work on. I think a lot of it comes down to to level creation actually. I think the game is there's enough flexible elements to that game that can be worked together um, in a lot of interesting ways. So I'm kind of hoping mappers will sort of take over for a period of time and make some maps that we could play. Um, and then from there, it wouldn't be hard to add a few new game map entities that the mappers could use to create some new heists. And uh, so, yeah, I'd like to also focus on the parts of that game that I think are the most interesting. Like, the most interesting part of that game to me is is the warehouse. So there's this, ask, there's this part of the game where you're, um, two players have to get to kind of the middle edges of this warehouse and kind of press a button at the same time. Um, while another player or two players are up in a vent above looking down. And so you kind of have to coordinate with each other and communicate of when to move where, um, what cover to take to hide from the guards. That type. Of, that's the type of gameplay I really liked in that game. And that's what I want to um, encourage more through the through making the game any further. But yeah, I don't know if, if and when I'll work on it more. But yeah, it kind of depends on you know what other people are, are doing with it. So what other computer games are you playing in your free time, other than NS2? <laughs> Com yeah, computer, I, I haven't been playing a lot of computer games recently. I played, we played Monaco last Friday in the office about a week ago, um, with, uh, we had four people going, and that was fun. It was very chaotic. I think I want to try the game with, uh, like, two or three people, because with four people, it's, it's so chaotic. Um, and I was playing a lot of Tribes Ascend um, last year. That was the, the last game I put a lot of time on in, on terms of computer games. But recently, I, I've been playing a lot of a uh, card game called Netrunner, which is uh, just a fascinating game. And I would encourage everyone to go and, and just buy it immediately and start playing it a lot so I have more people to play with eventually. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Netrunner is kind of the, the game. I'm this type of gamer where I, I kind of pick up a game and I play it for hundreds of hours and I don't play other games so it was Battlefield 1942 from like between the years 2002 to 2005 that's basically all I played and then other ga various games um, yeah I just pick up a game and I, I play it a lot and I don't play a lot of other games so right now it's the card game Netrunner so how uh, just a little bit of a follow-up question to that how often when you play another game uh, does it happen where you're kind of like some certain feature or something you're kind of like, oh, this would be kind of cool if we modified it a bit and put it in NS2. Like, has that happened before? Um, I'm trying to think of something specific for NS2. I mean, that type of thing happens a lot. With with NS2, it's going to be hard to think of something specific. Um, I guess, okay, one, one thing is I really liked how <laughs> the jetpacks worked in Tribes Ascend. And obviously, like, it wouldn't really translate to NS2 due to how the, the levels work. But I, I liked how um, in Tribes Ascend when you, you jumped, and then I guess when you got to, like, the apex of your jump, if you're still holding down the, the jetpack key, you'll start jetpacking. So it's, you could kind of use spacebar for jump and, and jetpack. And I liked that. I don't think we've really implemented that in NS2 or how it would work, but that's the type of thing I think would be worth trying. Um, but that happens all the time with, with other games and other games I'm making. And... Um, yeah, it's, that, that's definitely 
happening all the time. Uh, falling back to NS2, I have one important question out of belief. Marines or aliens? Ah, uh, in NS1, it was always Marines. I, I just, I don't know why, but I actively hated the aliens. And I, <laughs> I can't even remember why, but for NS1, it was definitely 100%. I don't think I ever played aliens. It was always Marines. And uh, NS2, early on in development, I was really into like the Lurk. That was my favorite. And I'm talking really early on in development, like back when he had the sniper rifle. That, that wasn't my favorite part, but um, before he had the bite and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, that, that was, it was probably Aliens, and more recently, it's moved back to Marine. So I, I, I really like Marine Commander, that's one of my favorite roles in the game, and uh, I, I enjoy just being a Marine on the ground, a grunt with like a, a grenade launcher and a jetpack, that's probably my favorite, favorite combo right now. Alright, um, honestly, I also love Marines every time, jetpack and hunting phase was my type of thing. But going on to the next question, what did you learn during the mod jam, and, and what will you do differently next time? It's a good question. Um, generally, the mod jam was, I think everyone agrees, was really successful. It was, um, it was a really fun you know, week of game development, um, very productive, and there, I guess I would... I would, there was probably, like, there was some aspects of development that weren't totally smooth, like sounds, which was something that um, the fighting team specifically needed a lot of, just getting sounds up and running didn't go as smooth as it should have, so it would be those, like, rough edges that um, I'd want to work out more, but overall it went really well, and uh I think the primary thing we learned is that doing a mod jam is a lot of fun, and we should try and do more of them. And you know, there, there was—I mean, after doing it, there was even talk of like, how can we make it so we can do these more, and like that makes sense as a company and <laughs> stuff like that. So, you know, I guess the final question here uh, in this uh, in this section is—it's um, very important as well. Does the programmer make the beard, or the beard make the programmer? So, you know, a magician is not allowed to, to <laughs> give away his secrets, and I, I feel like a magician in this sense. I just don't think I could answer this question. <laughs> not giving away the secrets, not giving away the beard secrets. <laughs> I, it, it wouldn't be fair to the other programmers in the world, and I'd, I'd be an outcast, so I, I can't do it. Oh, he bailed out! He bailed out! <laughs> <laughs> the chat's going crazy! <laughs> Alright. So, um, well, let me uh, take a look down to see if there's any more audience um, questions here. Alright, looks like that is it. Unless you want to answer how many skulks does it take to change a light bulb from Blarney Stone. Uh... Just one and no ladder, right? Because they could climb on walls. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so that I don't concludes... know. I, I, making a punchline on the fly like that, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, so that concludes our interview here with Brian Cronin. Thank. I, I wanted to um, thank uh, first thank Brian for, for taking the time out here on a Saturday morning. Um, and, you know, how can, how can people find you? How can people follow you, um, Brian? Um, I'm on the NS2 website a lot, so it's not hard, but uh, I also have a Twitter, um, it's at Brian number one, should probably change that name soon, um, but that's my Twitter handle, and I also have a, a website that is there'sprizes.com, where I post um, primarily about the, the other projects I'm working on, I don't put a lot of NS2 stuff on there, but that's just my personal site with uh, games being posted and stuff like that. Awesome. And um, I wanted to thank also my co-interview, I <laughs> can't say that word, <laughs> Blind. Um, thank you for being here, man. Oh, it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed having the opportunity. It was a great interview. Um, yeah, also thanks, Brian, for this. Yeah, and you guys can follow um, all of um, Blind's info is to the right of his uh, his window there. So Twitter at blindns2, also YouTube YouTube.com/blindns. 
Um, uh, and I wanted to do a shout out to Nexus Esports for uh, that's uh, Daigo uh, Daigot in the chat room for helping moderate the chat and, and collecting the questions for us and putting it on our Google Doc and making sure that we don't waste time. So please follow him, twitter.com slash nxesports as well. And also I have a surprise here. I wanted to thank all the contributors um, that contributed questions. So these are the people that contributed questions. Um, I mean, there were so many. Uh, these are the people that of the questions we used. Let me put them up on the screen here. Screen You're here. basically thanking the people who did your job for you. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. It's always good, I guess. So there we go. Uh, those are the contributors: Arroyos, Benson, Bongofish, Dragonsmith, Dosco, Exoskelet, uh, Gisp, Gordalot, Hypergrip, Industry, Kujasan, Mindstorm, Rez, Scaredy Bob, Smarticus Rex, Squishpokes, Tummy Yummy, Venatos, and Zao. Whew. Thanks so oh, much. I, <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for having me on here. And this was uh, really well done, very professional. And uh, I always want to just give a thanks to our playtesters. We have an enormous community of playtesters who playtest a game every, almost every single day. And uh, Scardy Bob and Kuji, which you named, are a part of those, part of that group. And uh, I always want to thank them every opportunity I get. Oh yes, and one, uh, yeah, and one more thing as well is um, Iron Horse. Um, do we have that link uh, for the GoFundMe? Uh, if you guys don't know, um, you guys probably do. It's all over the forums and Twitter and all that stuff. But Iron Horse. Uh, his house, his business, everything got burned down in the fire in California um, just recently. And we'll try to post the GoFundMe. There it is, Zephram and Fleet Command doing it. Um, if you guys can help out in any way, $1, $5, $10, it doesn't, doesn't matter. He lost everything. Uh, and my you know, prayers go out to him and his family to hopefully they can get through this. I couldn't imagine uh, that happened to me. So good luck to Iron Horse. Um, and if you guys can throw any support uh, to him, uh, this community is so awesome. I believe they've they've raised over seven thousand uh, dollars in in about a day or uh, yeah. so. Yeah, in just eight hours, it was something like sixty three hundred. So it was really yeah. a really incredible response, yeah. and I know he really appreciates that. Yeah. So um, yeah, guys, if you can can do anything there, um, that would be great. Um, Again, over here, you guys can follow me on Twitter at StingRedDog. My YouTube's youtube.com slash StingRedDog. Um, give a follow, all that stuff. I have a new Facebook page that sucks, um, and it's new, and it's got, like, no likes. So, yeah, I don't even have it up here <laughs> on, my, on my screen. But um, check out my schedule uh, below on my Twitch channel for casting schedules. Um, there's a big one um, coming up tomorrow. It got moved up two hours early. Um, that's Hard Day versus Radical, undefeated teams in EU Division uh, 2, Group A, I believe. Um, and that is going to be a pretty good match. Also, the uh, NSL semifinals are starting tomorrow as well. There's going to be some great matches, um, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, and that is it for us. I wanted to thank again. Brian, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and Blind and NXC Sports, thanks, guys, for being here. Uh, thanks, man. Daigo, you can actually say something now. <laughs> <laughs> He's been uh, in here well... the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just uh, want to say uh, thank you for being here. It was a pleasure of being on this interview and modding the chat. Uh, love you guys uh, a lot, and also to the people that submitted the questions during the interview. Thank you so much for your input. I posted the links to follow Brian and all the casters here on the chat as well, so make sure you follow them, and I'll catch you guys later. Thank you. All right, guys, so we are out. This has been Red Dog for Red Dog TV. I'll catch you later. <laughs>